I grew up in a town so small that not only did everybody know your name, they knew your story. They knew your parents' story. And if you'd lived there long enough, they probably knew your grandparents' story as well. It was kind of neat. It was like a home, a close-knit, extended family. But frankly, some days, it could get downright claustrophobic. And it closed in on me. It was those days that I would climb the mountain in back of our house. Not all the way up. Only as far as the underground stream that my dad had pointed out time and time again. He showed me where the special rock was. And you would roll the rock away and there you would uncover the screen that kept the leaves and the debris out of the, out of the stream and find the tin cup that sat on a little shel rock shelf. You would dip that cup into that cold water and it was cold all year round. Sweetest, coolest water on earth living water. <clears throat> and I would pour a cup of that and I would lay back and look at the world down the hill. It was an interesting view from there because all the problems, all the people, all the hassles were so much smaller from on top of the mountain. And the world, ah, the world was wide open, full of promise, and hope, excitement, new journeys. You could look up and down the river, across the valleys. Ah. And if you stayed up there long enough, you could make your way back down the mountain and live with a new perspective on life. Mountains do that. They give you an interesting perspective. And today we find ourselves on the mountain with Jesus and Peter, James, and John. And while we're up there, Jesus is transfigured, transformed. His clothing becomes dazzling white. His face shines. He's joined by Moses and Elijah, the law, the prophets. And then a cloud descends and a voice from heaven booms like James Earl Jones. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And then they all disappear. And the disciples want to hang out there for a while. But Jesus says, no, it's time to go back down the hill. It's a strange story, if that's all you hear of it. I discovered many years ago that it's really part of a, a longer story that we don't tend to read as one story, but it begins clear back in Caesarea Philippi with a question that haunts all of the Gospels. Who is Jesus? Jesus asked the question, who do people say that I am? The disciples respond, the polls say these days, top of the list, you're John the Baptist, come back to life. But others, you know, close second, you're Elijah, one of the other prophets, maybe something like Moses, a lawgiver. Jesus then says, but who do you say that I am? And it's Peter that pipes up, you're the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the one we've been waiting for. Jesus says, right you are, but this is what that means. I have to go to Jerusalem. And when I go to Jerusalem, they will arrest me, beat me, crucify me. And on the third day, I will rise. I don't think they ever heard that last part. Peter gets indignant. No way. 
let's just hang out here for a while. Cool our jets. Maybe gain some more momentum for the movement. Maybe some more support. And she says, get behind me, Satan. Next thing you know, we're on the mountain. And this time, the answer comes from God. This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. That phrase, beloved son, is a very interesting one in scripture. It only appears one other place. There's only one other beloved son in all of scripture. It's Isaac, the son of Abraham. The one whom Abraham is instructed to sacrifice. Although in the end, God provides a scapegoat. This time there will be no scapegoat for the sacrifice. Humanity will crucify our God for the sake of control, of power, fear, anxiety. Who knows what really motivated them? But he was scary stuff. He had to be silenced. There is a cloud that hangs over Mount Transfiguration. Because from there, the perspective is Jerusalem and death. Life down the valley is not pretty. It's no wonder the disciples want to hang out on the mountain. It's kind of cool up there, you know, lots of excitement. life down the valley is a scary place at times. We know about life in the valley all too well. Not only the day-to-day -day stuff that we deal with all the time, but throw on top of it a little pandemic, economic meltdown, political confusion, an overall contentiousness of life. It's been very interesting as I've begun to help congregations and people process COVID, what they're feeling these days. It's pretty universal. There's a high level of fear, a high level of anxiety, and an awful lot of grief. We know this stuff. We live it. It is overwhelming at times. And so to climb up Mount Transfiguration with the disciples is a good thing. It gives us a bit of a new perspective. Because not only is there a cloud hanging over that mountain, a foreshadowing of crucifixion and death. But there is also a note of resurrection there. In fact, scholars have tried to convince me over the years that this is really a post-resurrection story that the gospel writers just kind of cut and pasted back into the gospel. I'm not sure I buy that. But whatever, it does have that ring to it. The dazzling white apparel, the gathered saints, a reminder that life in the valley is not the only life. For God promises resurrection, new life, even out of death. We walk by faith, not knowing where we're going, but only that God's hand leads us and his love supports us. That's the perspective from the mountain. Because there's another question that gets asked up there, and that is, who are we? We are the beloved ones. Those marked with the cross of Christ. 
washed in the waters of new life, living waters, cool and clear, that we might gain enough perspective to take the next step through the valley, even if it be the valley of the shadow of death. We shall fear no evil, for he goes with us. <laughs>